which is pretty much what I feel like right now. <laughs> Let me give you a couple of scriptures to write down that um, might be helpful <clears throat> to you. There's actually three words translated burnt offering. I'm going to give you two of them. <clears throat> And I'm going to give you two different scriptures that relate to that, but there are a lot of scriptures that speak of the burnt offering as the, the Ola, O-L-A-H, Ola, and that uh, is hello in Spanish. <laughs> and, um, uh, but one scripture that goes for Ola is Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. There it is, the, it is always translated burnt offering, but it's actually, there's two different words. The next word <clears throat> is holocaust, and that is Hebrews 10, verse 6, and many other scriptures, holocaust. I, there's much that I could actually share on this contrast and this reality that the word holocaust is used you know the burnt offering was set up you know 4,000 years ago something like that whatever a long th let's just say thousands and thousands of years um, the holocaust was what 50 years ago but the name the Jews chose for the event that took place to him, the offering up of the Jews, was Holocaust. I won't get into it, but there's some amazing things in connection with that. <clears throat> in Leviticus chapter 6, uh, verse 8 and 9, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, <clears throat> This is the law of the burnt offering. Okay, so here's the law of the burnt offering, not not. I'm making this a law and you must obey it. He's saying this is the law of it. This is the, the uh, how do you say that? This is the government of it. This is the way that it works. <clears throat> like the law of electricity works a certain way. Like the law of aerodynamics work a certain way. Like the law of gravity. This is the law of it. Yeah, if you throw something up, it's going to come down. It's a law. See, it's not like just a commandment he's telling you this is the law of it this is this is how it works this is the law of the burnt offering <clears throat> it is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night into the morning and the fire of the altar shall burn shall be burning in it fire of the altar shall be burning in it. This is the law of it, that the altar burns on the inside of it. Well, we know the altar represents the cross, amen? And this is an ongoing process. He says this is the law of it. It is the, it is the, the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night until the morning. And, of course, in the morning, what do they do? They start another one that burns until the night. And it's not just that they sacrifice a burnt offering in the morning and they sacrifice it and it burns up real quick and then they come back at night and they do it. The whole point is that this thing is supposed to burn right up until the next time you offer the next one. It is, it's, like the, it's like the cinders and the, uh, you know, like a fire. Have you ever seen a fire and it looks like it goes out and you stick a poker in there and shake it around and all of a sudden it... You know, deep within this thing, on the inside, it is burning with the altar. The altar is burning it, is filling it, is <clears throat> constantly at work on the inside of the burnt offering. And so um, I realized when looking at the schedule and everything with everything that I wanted to share that uh, last class I was in uh, Holland <clears throat> and I missed two classes, and the time before that, I forget what was up, but I was going for two, and so that was four, and I'm already running short. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> try to do something. I'm going to try to read 
and not comment. And most of you who know, been around me know that that's real hard for me to do. So, but I'm going to try to do that somewhat. I don't you know, y'all pray for me. <laughs> the word burnt offering means what ascends up. The burnt offering literally is not really fully comprehended in what's happening on the altar, but what the altar is producing. which is an ascending up of a sweet savor, and they're all called sweet savor offerings. And it is that that is getting to the Lord, <coughs> to the Father. The burnt offering was, and these are important things because we'll deal with it later, the burnt offering was slaughtered, it was skinned, it was cut to pieces, and then it was burned up. <coughs> the phrase used in verse 9, which uh, the last part of verse 9 says, uh, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. Another translation I looked up says that that, that um, can also be translated up in smoke. You ever heard that phrase before? Everything went up in smoke, or my life went up in smoke. or That means you pretty much lost everything in the, uh, in the external to gain that which is true sweetness. That which is true savor. That which is sweet, but only to the Lord. In other words, you see I'm commenting. In other words, the burnt offering is not going to be a true burnt offering unless its greatest desire is to bring forth something that is sweet to the Lord. Obviously, if you're going to be skinned, cut in pieces, all this, Obviously, it's not what's going to be most happy for you. That's tough. And, you know, you don't get to a burnt offering until there's been a full, clear explanation and understanding of the sin offerings, where, where all of a sudden you're no longer the issue. And that's hard to do, because with the sin offering, you're the total issue. I mean, you know, basically, it's all about you, it's all about what you did, it's all about your guilt, it's all about your failure, it's all about, you know, whether you have faith in this enough to walk in uh, clarity of conscience with the Lord, or are you worrying about yourself all the time? It, does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say these things, where you're constantly, um, you know, you're trying to focus on the Lord, but you're worrying about yourself. Well, did I sin? Well, did I fail? Did I not do something right? Did I... Um, you know, did I not do something? You know, did I do something or did I not do something? And uh, I'm telling you, when you get into these places, these things can sneak up on you and, and these little voices try to condemn you and try to pull you down and try to declare something other than the heart of the Lord. Anybody ever been through that? Where, I mean, you're ripped. You're being ripped and torn. It's almost like you're being cut into pieces. Oh, yeah, that's what happens to the burnt offering. <clears throat> but it is all for one purpose, and that is for that which ascends up, that which pleases him. So it, it, it's up in smoke. All that was seen, known, and recognized in the natural went up in smoke. Only the essence ascended. God removes all the things of the outward that that we thought would be so important, and only that which is of the eternal spirit ascends up. It is a slow burning transition from the outward to the eternal. That is not easy. Because it's a long time process. You know, like I said, it's not just fire comes down, eats it up, it's over with. Not with the burnt offering. There is a slow burn. I remember I had a, a blues album by Christians called Slow Burn. Well, it's a slow burn. I mean, it's a slow burn. The baptism of Jesus was a picture of going down into the waters of death. When he came up, what ascended out of the waters of death was the essence of Christ. And the Father was well pleased with a satisfying fragrance. Now, you know, I mean, there's scriptures like in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 that says, uh, <clears throat> set your affections on things above. Well, what is that? What it says, then what does it say? Where Christ sitteth, it talks about what, is his, what has ascended. 
You see what I mean? Our lives are so much in, in what is here, you know, but what has ascended? I got news for you. You have and you already have. You have ascended. You are seated together. You're not going to. You're not going to get something someday. There's a reality now of this that we can embrace and, and that can keep you from the fires of the earth. You understand what I mean? The, the trials and the cutting and the, and the flay, flaying and the, you know, the skinning and, the, and all of the things that happen, but it's only going to be found in him and it's only going to be found in union with him. And now I know that we all know this to some degree. Thank God for the doctrine of it. <clears throat> but these things, I'm going to say it like this, but it's not the true meaning. These things will be tested, but that's not the true meaning because it's not a test. It is the way of the Lord. You know, we, we would like to make it a test so that I can pass the test. Well, you don't ever pass the test of the way of the Lord. You just live in it. You just live in it. And so, but, you know, I mean, who's going to do that? Who's going to, who's going to want to give up anything now to the reality that we have now in Christ? You, did you notice the wording I said? Would give up anything now for the fullness of what we could have right now in Christ? In other words, be like a true, how many of you would like to be like a true branch that is just sprouting with the fruit of Jesus instead of your fruit? That's just burgeoning forth with his life that's pleasing the Father because it's resurrection life coming forth in you as a branch, see. Because the death, the corn of wheat, the seed, already fell into the ground and died. Most Christians, they're not. They're just after living a good Christian life so that they'll get into heaven. That's what they're thinking about. That's what they're working on. They're not thinking about burgeoning forth with the life of Christ to please the Father and to, and to be an overflowing vessel of the fullness of Jesus so that the Father says, I see the acceptable one in you and I'm well pleased. You know, we're usually too busy trying to keep ourselves straight so that God will accept us, which is ridiculous. You are only accepted in union with the beloved. That's uh, Ephesians 1, what, 6, something like that. One four. <clears throat> All right. So, what pleases God is what is above. Christ's sweet savor. We are to seek those things that are above. The fragrance is what survives the fires. The fragrance is what survives. We always want to know what's going to survive. The essence. The essence of the Lord. And you know, gosh, I. I'm going to just comment a little bit here. But the essence of the Lord, folks, is undefinable. You can see one person who's a good Christian, who is really godly, really prays a lot and whatever, and you can meet somebody who has the essence of the Lord and you cannot define it, you cannot fully say what it is, but you know that's Jesus. That's not just for Jesus. That's the Lord. It's the essence. It's well, the only way you're going to find that is when somebody's gone through a great burning. Somebody's gone through a great loss. That's the only way you'll ever discover that. And it's hard. It's not fun. It's not easy. But, but there is things beyond fun and things beyond easy. And that is a love. Love, folks. Love can quench many waters. Love can, you know. Anybody ever been in love? Love can get you through a lot. Can I get an amen? Or are you too shy to say love can get you through a lot? I think it can. Well, love for the Lord, well, maybe like a pioneer wife, you'd come over here and you'd want to just be with your husband and you'd live in a little uh, log cabin that he'd built and it's cold and the winters are hard and the times are tough and the Indians attack and there's all this kind of stuff, but you're glad to be with him. Can I get an amen? So that's the spirit behind it is it doesn't, it doesn't change everything in the natural, but it makes everything sweet. I mean, there's a sweetness about it. There's a sweetness to it. Not that the thing is sweet, but that you're gaining the presence of the Lord. You're gaining the essence of the Lord. And you know what? You may not in your mind be able to preach the greatest sermon in the world, 
you may not be the best minister on the planet, but people will pick up the essence of Christ. Man, isn't that, isn't that what we, we're, we're, I mean, body, and he's the life. Well, body means we're a vessel to be filled up with him. Branch, and he's the vine. Branch means we're a vessel to be filled up with him. Earthen vessel and treasure means we're just a vessel to be filled up with him. You just go on and on and on, folks. It never was about you. It never was about your Christianity. It never was about your goodness. It was always about you being willing to lose things in the earth to gain Christ. And that's what Paul said. Paul said, what things were gained to me, I count loss that I may gain Christ. You see what I mean? There is a gain. There is a gain. He says, I count what things were gained to me in this earth, I count loss that I might gain Christ. There's, it's not all loss. There is a gain. It just depends. If you really, really love the Lord, this is good stuff. And if you really, really love yourself, <laughs> you're not going to like me even for saying that. And I'm aware that that happens. All right, so... <clears throat> The fragrance is what survives the fire. What ascends up is only Christ. Amen? I mean, we're in him, but he's the only one that's resurrected. We're in him. We're one with him. But God resurrects his son. He doesn't resurrect you and you and you and you and you. He resurrects his son and us in him. I mean, didn't it say that in Ephesians? That we have, have been raised up. Notice the wording, have been, past tense, have been raised up and made to sit together, together, together in heavenly places, not in the earth, in union with Christ Jesus. Okay? Well, as long as that's a doctrine, we can, we can like that doctrine. We can accept it because something bears witness. The Spirit bears witness in our hearts that that's the truth. But... There is a, a practical reality that you go through with that. And I don't know anybody that's ever gone through it that it wasn't hard. But it wasn't, I don't know anyone who went all the way through it and it wasn't worth it. <laughs> that's the only way I can put it, that it wasn't worth it, everything and more. Because, I mean, you take this book and, you know, or anything in this earth and it begins to crumble, you know, I mean, it gets old and starts to crumble and everything like that and that crumbles and then this crumbles and that crumbles and everything falls apart, it breaks down, it stops and all this kind of stuff. But Jesus' life just seems to keep growing and going and filling and expanding and there's, of, of his government there's no end. Of his increase. There is no end. Well, that would mean he must increase and I must decrease. So, so if that's the case, you, you see, if you describe it like I did up to this very moment, you might go, I don't like that. I don't want it. But if I just said he must increase and I must decrease, you go, oh, amen. I mean, am I right or wrong? I mean, it's just a matter of semantics, how you word it. And if you just said it like that, you'd go, I want Jesus to increase and I really do want me to decrease. But if you make it practical and you say, you're going to lose, whoso lo loveth his life in this earth shall lose it. But who that loves the Lord, who that loves the gospel, loves the truth, will gain. And Paul said, I want to gain Christ. And so, and just to say this, you know, you can't talk anyone into this. This is this is totally ridiculous to try to talk anyone into this kind of stuff. You don't talk anyone into it. First of all, you wouldn't want to because if you talked them into it, it wouldn't be from the heart, and it would be they would want to come back and kill you later. And we have a registry of over the years where people have done that. But, but it wasn't because I didn't say all along... Uh, now, what, you know, and clarify and say, you know, and I'm not putting this on you. It has to be a free will and everything, you know. It's not because I didn't say that. It's because they didn't hear that. And so then later on they go, well, you, you know, I didn't want to die. 
And you put me through, obviously not death, but near-death experience. <laughs> near-death experiences, you know? And, and, and the truth is, I didn't personally put them through that for the most part. The Lord does that because they probably play, prayed. Don't ever, let me warn you about something. Don't pray, don't say stuff to the Lord because he listens. <laughs> don't say you love him. Don't say you want him more than anything. Don't say that. Just say I like you a lot. <laughs> Just say you're my pal. And I, I like hanging out with you. But don't tell him stuff like, I'll do anything. Don't say stuff like this, whatever it takes. <laughs> don't say that because he's going to go, oh, and he's going to look at you and go, oh, isn't that precious one of my own wants to be with me and, and they're willing to trust me as I lead them through not just the green pastures but the valley of the shadow of death. And then you get in the valley of the shadow of death. Ah! What are you doing now? Why would you leave me in here? This is crazy. This is insane. There's darkness here. I thought you were the Lord of light. <laughs> <clears throat> these, these things are tough, man. They are. But there is the revelation of Christ. There is the Holy Spirit. There is the one who wants to open the eyes of our heart. Anybody ever sang that song before? Open the eyes of my heart. Not... Not just my human eyes, not just the human eyes into the brain. Because when you get into the crisis, that won't hold you. It's the eyes of my heart into my heart. Where I am with the Lord. And when it starts getting tested, yeah, uncomfortable, yes. Hurting, yes. Not exactly what you were thinking it was going to be. Yes, <laughs> but there has to be faith because he doesn't just give it all to you instantly, does he? There has to be faith in the Lord, faith in the Lord. There has to, I, I mean, he doesn't really ask for a lot, does he? <laughs> you know, but faith. Just, just trust me, Jesus said. Just believe. Believe what? In me. Just believe that my motives towards you are not evil. I'm not out to hurt you. I'm not being mean to you. I'm not setting you up so that I can, you know, drop you later on or something. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm with you. I love you. And I'm going to bring you into the, into the rest so that you will live in Sabbath beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing all right let's read on here in leviticus 6 so let's start at verse 11 because i want to talk about the fact that this is the continual burn offering continual okay it's important to realize that so i have quite a few scriptures here let's start in verse 11 and he shall uh and he shall put off his garments put on other garments and carry forth the ashes outside the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. It shall not be put out. Not even when you take it off of the altar. Not even when it's just ashes. Not even when you go into a clean place outside the camp. Don't put it out. Don't put it out. Keep the fire burning. Life, circumstances, people, bad things happen and wants to put out your fire. Keep the fire burning. Amen, Carolyn? Amen. Amen? Praise God. Keep the fire burning. Uh, let's look in uh, Exodus because these are some good scriptures too. Exodus chapter 29. 
we'll just take a, a few moments to go through several of these scriptures because I, I think it's good to, to just read the word of God and get it flowing. Exodus 29 and starting in verse 38 and we'll only go down to verse 42. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening. And with the one lamb, a tenth part of the flour mixed with a fourth part of a hen of beaten oil, and the fourth part of a hen of wine, a drink offering. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening, and thou shalt do therein according to the meal offering of the morning and according to the drink offering thereof for a sweet savor an offering made by fire unto the Lord this shall be a continual burnt offering listen to this throughout your generations see we just want to make it you know every day and it is every day isn't it but it is a continual burnt offering throughout your generations in other words, pass it on. Let this reality get in you, and then don't just leave it in you. Put it in your kids. Put it in other brothers and sisters. Put it in the next generation. <clears throat> Throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. Okay, now let's go to Numbers 28. This, these all things relate, Numbers uh, 28, these all relate to the law of this offering. As I said, like the law of gravity, they have, it is the way that it is. Numbers 28, beginning with verse 3. We'll just read verse 3 and 4. And thou shalt say unto them, this is the offering made by fire which ye shall offer unto the Lord. Two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day for a continual, day by day for a continual burnt offering. The one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other shalt thou offer at evening. And then uh, the final scripture on this uh, thing, First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 16. And verse 39. So if you've got my Bible, my kind of Bible, it's page 479. <laughs> if you don't, good luck. First Chronicles, chapter 16, and 30, verse 39 and 40. And Zadok, the priest, and his brethren, the priest before the tabernacle of the Lord in the high place that was at Gideon, to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord upon the altar of the burnt offering continually, morning and evening, so do according to all that is written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded Israel. All right, so let me see if I can read some. The, the burnt offering was daily. The priests, which we're the priests, you know. Did anybody go through that class recently on New Testament priesthood? The priests were to think of God's satisfaction daily, both in the morning and in the evening. The priests. This is what they, I mean, this was a big thing on their mind. Whatever duties they had, there was one thing that was important, and that was that daily morning and evening burnt offering needed to be going at all moments. You might be, you might light the candelabra, the candles, the golden candlestick, that's done. You might make the bread and set it on the table of showbread, that's done. But your mind has to constantly be on the continual burnt offering if you're a priest. And so, I'll read it again. The priest, we, were to think of God's satisfaction daily, both in the morning and evening. The continual burnt offering represented not just something that was forever, not just something that was forever, but something continual, meaning uninterrupted. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I mean, you can, you can say something is forever and it not have any, any momentary impact right now. You see what I mean? You know, 
but that's why I worded it this way, to say uh, not just something that was forever, but something continual, meaning uninterrupted. Not just that the once offering was good for all time. That was the sin offering. Can I get amen? amen? The sin offering was once and for all time. But the continual burn offering is different. Okay? Not just once offering for good for all time, but that Jesus is continually given. This makes Jesus totally and wholly the satisfaction of God's heart of his heart. Hear the words of one who is a whole burnt offering. I do always those things that please my father. You see, he, he could have said, think, come on, he could have said, I always do the right thing. Did you hear the difference? Anybody hear the difference? He could have, he, his focus could have been on doing the right thing. That's not where his heart was. His heart was on the Father. He didn't say, I always do the right thing. He said, I do always those things that please the Father. Because he's a whole burnt offering. Our walk as living sacrifices is daily. <laughs> we should offer Christ daily to the Father. Through him, let us offer up a sacrifice continually or daily. Hebrews 13, 15. God delights in those who offer Christ daily. This does not just apply to a special time of ministry, like a short-term ministry outreach, short-term missions outreach. It doesn't just apply to a special time of ministry or during his earth walk, when Jesus walked only. But at all times and under all, all conditions, whether in heaven, earth, or hell, Or hell. Anybody been there? Me too. It seems that I live there. <laughs> Thank God that I live in Christ too. Amen? Amen? Thank God there's that reality. We do not give ourselves continually, but do, and I'm speaking of how we are apart from the, the sacrifice. Let me just clarify this. Christ in us will continually give himself to the Father if we let him be the motivation and the life of this vessel. Do you understand? I mean, that's, it's not a work. It's not a work. It's not something you have to do. It's something you have to, for example, it says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. It didn't say work until you get it in there. The word let is a yielding word. It is not a not a striving word, but a letting go word. But we're not like Jesus. We're not like the burnt offering that should be offered in, on the altar of our heart. We do not give ourselves continually, but do it when it pleases us or is to our benefit or to make ourselves feel more given and spiritual. Some are, con are consumed with God satisfying them all day instead of themselves being con conformed all day long for God and for God's satisfaction. When you live by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the issues are what is right or wrong, sinful or not. But when you live by life, the life of Christ, the issue is about pleasing the Father. See, that, that really changes it up because we say, okay, I want Jesus in me and I want the life in me, but we're still thinking in terms of if it was us living and how we'd live to please or to, to do the right thing. You see what I'm saying? I mean, we keep, we keep shifting under the law. We're constantly shifting under the law. Jesus fulfilled the law, but it doesn't ever say he was all focused on the law. It said that he was always trying to please the Father. I do always those things that please the Father. Um, so when you live by life, the issue is about not right and wrong, good and evil. The issue is about pleasing the Father. And you can only do that by, by giving the acceptable sacrifice, Christ being offered through you. We need to offer back to God the one life that will truly satisfy. 
Okay, I want to talk, ab I want to change the subject now and get into an area that is going to take us a while. That's why I was hoping to do more reading here. Uh, I want to talk about the way that the burnt offering is offered. I noticed when I was reading all these scriptures about the sweet savor offerings and their presentation in Leviticus that he doesn't get into the spiritual explanation of everything at all. He simply tells you how to offer the right sacrifice. I mean, it's really more on a practical level of this, just do this in this manner. And so that made me begin to start looking at this and say, you know what? There is a way that God wants Christ given to him. Now think, think of most of Christianity, how they would give Christ to, to the Father, I mean, or to God, or to whatever. First of all, most of them wouldn't think in terms of giving God Christ. They would think in terms of them giving Christ something them giving Jesus something, right? But this is the way, as priests, that we're supposed to give Jesus to God. And that affected me. And I think that thought pow, opened up my eyes, began to help me to, to see exactly what, that, that this was, this was that God, to satisfy God, I did need to give him Jesus, but there were some very specific things outlined there. You know what I'm saying? In the scriptures, it wasn't just, a, well, just, just do good and just try to give me Jesus. You know what I mean? I mean, it was like, there, if you're going to give me Jesus, give me Jesus in this manner. I was, I was deeply affected by that. It is one thing to simply kill your offering and offer it to God. Right? Kill it. Put it on the altar, put fire on it. It's one thing to do that. But in the case of the burnt offering, it was required that there be an examining of the parts. The priest had to examine the parts and had to take out specific parts. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I mean, my God, this is not just give him an offering. In other words, this is not us just pointing back 2,000 years ago and saying, there's your offering, he's offered. This is taking that sacrifice apart and examining it so that we can know what's on the inside. What's on the inside of the thing being offered. So, uh, in Galatians 4.16, there are, don't turn there, but there are three crucifixions mentioned. Christ crucified, the world crucified unto me, and I am crucified. In other words, I'm just using this as an example to show you that there is, if you start cutting up this, this crucifixion, you're starting to see parts. You see what I'm saying? Now, really what I want to refer to more is on the inside of Jesus, but I'm trying to get you to see that in one crucifixion there were a lot of parts. Not just Jesus was crucified. You're crucified. The world's crucified. And to start cutting this thing up a little more and looking at it. Um, just a few short points. One is that it said that you're supposed to wash some of the insides and to take the time. And I just wrote down, stay in the word concerning the sacrifice of Jesus. You take the sacrifice, you open it up, and you wash it. And you, you, you uh, are staying in the word in relationship to not just gentle Jesus, meek and mild, walking the shores of Galilee, healing people. Folks, that's not the one you're supposed to be examining. You're supposed to, as a priest, you're supposed to examine the sacrifice. That's, that's a whole different ballgame. And then just a word on the blood. Uh, the blood was settled long ago, so the offerer never deals with the blood. Not the person who's bringing a burnt offering, they never deal with the blood, only the priest. The part that the priest played was to pour out the blood on the altar and lay the sacrifice on the fire. All else was carried out by the offerer. 
Did you hear what I said? The priest basically poured out the blood and then set the, what is it? Where did I say that? Um, and laid the sacrifice on the fire. Now, there's major stuff going on here that you and me are supposed to be in tune with when, when we offer God Christ. Because why? Because the old covenant is a shadow. A sh if I had a wall up here and a bright light over there and I put my hand up there, you could see the shadow. But, folks, the proof of the shadow is the truth. And there is a true for New Testament believers in relationship to how to offer Christ to the Father. And it's the true. It's not a shadow. God wants his lamb. He wants his son. And, he want, and it's going to be required of a priest and an offerer to give him that in a specific way. All right. So... Um, and then this, though it was a whole burn offering, that's what it's called, another, another term, a continual burn offering, whole burnt offering, and I've used that in the past. Though it was a whole burn offering, that only means all of it was offered. But in fact, it was not offered as a whole, but was immediately, upon being slain, cut into pieces. It's just wholly given, meaning completely given but it is not given as a whole. We'll see that in just a minute. <clears throat> All right, uh, back to Leviticus chapter 1, and I want to talk now about the inward parts that are offered. The inward parts. Leviticus 1 and verse 6. We're going to read just a... 6, 9, and 13. Verse 6. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. Verse 9. This is Leviticus 1. But its inwards and its legs shall he wash in water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now verse 13. But he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water, and the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So you notice it mentioned several times about taking out the inward parts. And you do that to examine it. <clears throat> Opening up and examining the inward parts relates not to what is in his head, such as his plans, but the things concerning his desire, his motive, and his heart, his love. And I think most of us believe God so loved the world that he, so we believe that God loved us because Jesus died, but we don't believe he loves us enough to stick with us. But Jesus does. But you're not going to know that by quoting John 3.16. <laughs> you're going to know that by getting into the heart of Jesus, by getting into the inward parts of Jesus. That means you're going to have to quit playing with the surface stuff. Can I get amen? amen? Quit playing with the surface stuff and let's start going deeper into the heart of the Lord. So it's, remember that as burnt offering, Jesus was totally toward the Father according to his inward desire, not just his deeds and his actions. These desires were not focused on himself, and that's what makes him a burnt offering because it's not about himself. We see the love Jesus has for the Father. This desire was total and holy toward God. But how are we really going to know Jesus' inward heart unless we take the time to examine it? For example, Isaiah 53, 12 tells us that he poured out his soul unto death, right? He poured out his soul unto death. This means that there was more involved with the offering of Jesus than the physical aspect. Most people just see a, a body. 
I mean, the, anybody see the movie, The uh, Passion of Christ? That's what it's called, The Passion of Christ? That's, yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's a good movie and everything, but it's pretty much just about the body. And what he, fi- I mean, it really is. It's pretty much what happened to his body, and then you go, oh, darn, man. That makes me feel bad Jesus went through all that. You don't know half of it. You, I tell you what, you can be, you can be hit by somebody and then be raided by that same person that slapped you or hit you. And what hurts way worse is their words. Amen. Your bruised, bleeding lip will, will heal up. And maybe you might even forget it. But those words, man, they just stick with you. They stick with you. Well, that's your soul being hit. Jesus poured out his soul unto death. Anyway, I'm not pointing to go into that, but just to show you that the sacrifice of Jesus is way more than just him physically dying and going, ouch, oh, you know. In fact, I don't know when I'll share next, but I might share on some things the Lord shared with me on forgiveness and and the incredible thing that happened on the cross. I don't know why it never occurred to me in these words that forgiveness came from the cross. I don't know why it never, I mean, we, we know that. We say somehow it came from God and it must have come from the cross, but I saw it come from the cross, I guess. Is the only way. Anyway, Lord willing, if, if he doesn't give me something else, and I forget to share that. All right, so it says he poured out his, his inward parts. Inward parts involves Jesus' motives and where his affections lie. Set your affections on things above. What, what is above? burn offering, that part of it which ascends up, not just earth realities surrounding that. In other words, it is not just about the right actions that Jesus did, but the motive and the desire behind the actions. Now, I want you to consider that. I don't know, man. There's a lot to be said on that, and I am not going to take the time. But we're always concerned about the right actions. Jesus did the right actions, and now I'm supposed to do the right actions. Folks, I'm telling you, you can do the right actions, and if your motive is wrong, then you're wrong. Your motive is where the seat, your heart is the seat of your motivation. If your heart's wrong, the action is not, doesn't sanctify you. Come on, think about that. Man. But, but most of Christianity is all about just doing the right thing and that Jesus did the right thing and we ought to do the right thing. Is that it, really? I mean, really, is that it? If that's it, you could, you know, you know what? If that's it, you could be a darn good Buddhist. <laughs> you could. Or even a Hindu. I don't know about some of the others. One flashed in my mind that, All right, let, uh, keep your place here in Leviticus because I'm pretty sure I'll be coming back. But let's just look at a scripture in uh, Philippians so that I can make a point here. Philippians chapter 1. Uh, a pretty amazing scripture, actually. Philippians 1.8. Philippians chapter 1, verse 8. For God is my witness how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what that says? Or the tender mercies of Jesus Christ. That says, I don't long after you. Listen to the word. He's not saying, I long after you. He's saying, I long after you after the inward parts of Jesus Christ at work in me. That ought to make some of you feel good because you don't really feel much for anybody. But that's okay. But I mean, come on, that's okay. It's long as you do by Christ. 
You say, I don't, you know, I don't love you, but Jesus does. Or you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I live by the life of Christ. You see, that's a whole nother thing. Mike Wallace shared that in a prayer meeting once, and it really stuck with me. It probably never was going to leave me. Just this thing that it is not about us having all the right things of our heart, but, and I'll get into that, but as you examine the parts, folks, we're one with the sacrifice that we're offering. We laid hands on that baby. Do you understand that? We laid hands on it. I don't mean like after the sin offering where you imparted your junk on it. I'm talking about you imparted you on it. You, you identified in oneness, in union with it, and said, yes, I'm one with this, and now I'm going to examine it and see what I'm one with. <laughs> Hallelujah. So since the sweet savor offerings deal with, and, and let me just say this and then say it again. Since the sweet savor offerings deal with fellowship of experience, now I'm going to just go on past that, but you might miss a huge part. The sweet savor offerings deal not with sin, but with fellowship of experience with the Lord. You are able to fellowship and identify and be one with him and to know what it is that these things are talking about. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that right now. Since the sweet savor offerings deal with fellowship of experience, the examination of these inward motives is not just to gain information about Jesus, but for these same desires to be worked into us. For this reason, Paul says in Philippians 1.8, I long after you all in the bowels, the inward parts of Jesus Christ. The apostle was basically saying that he does not offer God his own affections. Where do we get that from? Galatians 5.24 says that you are crucified along with your affections and desires. You don't offer him your affections. You offer him Christ's affections. Nor does he hold them as dear, your affections. He doesn't hold your affections as dear. He wants you to offer Christ in a specific way. We should not pray based on our affections. Did you know that there's a lot of problems and a lot of junk that happens because we're all in the big middle of the prayer, and we, I, oh, fix this person, I love them, and do this, and make this happen, and everything, and it's really all about what, it's either about us or about what we love. Our sympathies have no virtue in satisfying God. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's a shocker for some people. You know what, I could take you through I could take you through the scripture and shock you with how many people said, I'm sorry and I repent in the Old and New Testament that God rejected because it was them. Let's see if I can remember a few. Balaam, Pharaoh, Judas, um, Esau. I don't remember him saying I, I repent, but the, I'm, I'm literally, these guys literally said that. I mean, is that, you know, some good ones there? I mean, Pharaoh, Judas, I mean, there's some more, I, and some, still some shockers left. You just go, well, I thought if you just said the right words. I repent, I repent. No, no. He's not, and... It, in one sense, I could say it like this. He's not just after your heart. He's after dwelling in your heart. I mean, would anybody argue with that? I mean, if you do, if you want to, that's fine. But I'm just thinking there's nobody would want to argue with that. He's not just after your heart. He wants to dwell in your heart. See? All right, so... The apostle was basically saying that he does not offer God his own affections because in Galatians 5.24 he said, my affections and desires have been crucified, nor does he hold them as dear. We should not pray based on our affections. Our sympathies have no virtue in satisfying God. It is Christ's inward parts that are to be at work in us. Why do we keep trying to honor God based on a blemished sacrifice? 
Is there any chance I could? Yes. All right, I'm going to try to finish this little part. That means five minutes left. I thought she was wanting to give me five. <laughs> Thinking, I can't reach that far. Yeah, I stopped the train. <laughs> Yeah, like I told somebody the other day, man, I finally see light at the end of a tunnel, and it's a train. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I think I told you that, Faft, as a matter of fact. Um, <laughs> the inner life of Paul was Christ. Hmm, glory to God. Yes, glory to God, if it's Christ, Amen. Because that's what brings glory to God. The inner life. Well, what are we talking about about the inner life? What is the inner life? We can make that some sort of ethereal. Yes, the inner life of Paul was Christ. No, no, no. That's practical. His affections, his desires, his motivations. Yes, it's real. It's a real deal. Jesus can inhabit his body. It's an amazing thought. <laughs> but he actually can inhabit his body, and that's who we are. All right, a change happened in Paul, as described in Galatians 2.20, by two words. Not I. Okay, now listen to this. He is saying, he's not just saying not I. Not, you see, that's so ethereal. Not I. He is saying not my affections. Not my sympathies. See, we want to say, not I, not my cursing, not my smoking, not my chewing, chewing tobacco, or, you know, dipping snuff, not my bad habits. No, Paul didn't say, not my bad parts. He said, not I. That means my affections. Come on, can we... Can we at least say, Lord, if that's really true, I'd like for what's true in the Word of God to be at work in me. You don't have to like it. You don't have to say, you, in fact, I've done that with the Lord. I've said, Lord, I don't like this. And in my soul, I don't want that to happen. But I believe in my spirit, I really do want you. So I'm going to ask you to work that in me and, and please be patient with my kicking and screaming. And you know what he does when you do that? He goes, okay, I'll work with you then. You know? And he does, because he does love us. We're number three. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm bringing this baby home. <clears throat> okay, let's try this again. He's saying, not my affections and sympathies, meaning not Paul's inner tendencies of kindness, not Paul's inner tendencies of kindness, compassion, or care that Christ formed in the inward parts. We are in Christ or in union with Christ. This means that what we examine of the inward parts of the burnt offering are meant to be what is worked in ourselves. We are now partakers of the inward parts of the burnt offering and not just examiners of it any longer. You start, but you're... Your purpose for examining is so that you can know who you are because you're one with Jesus. If you don't examine, you'll be you and call yourself one with Jesus. Can I get an old me? Because <laughs> if, if we don't examine the inward parts, we'll just say we're one and it'll be us. Let's examine his heart. Let's believe in his heart. You know, never doubt in darkness what God has shown you in light. Anybody ever seen something in light and going, oh, yeah, yeah. We had a moment of, of it just a few minutes ago. A bunch of people going, yeah, yeah, and I, I like that. But I want to see when you go into darkness or you're going, you know, this is the truth. You may not be going, yeah, yeah. In fact, you probably won't. At least, you know, maybe, you know, maybe Paul did. I don't. I mean, I usually go into it, and I sort of have to be, you know, I have to bring to remembrance everything and sort of, I don't know. I'm a mess. 
I really am. I mean, I am. I'm a mess. It's like I have to, I have to wake up my spirit. It's like if I don't, my soul is ready to take over. I'm the boss here. Uh, we're, you know, you know what we're going to do in this circumstance? Freak out! You know? <laughs> I mean, that's what it's like, you know? And, uh, I mean, your soul may not be as wild as mine, but mine just like, he's just like, you know, he's like Jerry Lewis on steroids. <laughs> it's, it's scary. <clears throat> All right, let's see if I can finish this up. Uh, we must not see ourselves as outside of him, examining him, but be found in him. Say it again. Not see yourself as outside of him, examining him, but what you are examining is already true of you, and it's going to take your faith in Jesus and in union with Jesus. All right, let's take a break and come back in a little bit.